Welcome to our first lesson in the blood bank laboratory, which is entitled Safety in the Blood Bank. This lesson provides an overview of a blood bank safety program. Safety is a concern for everyone. Employer and employee must understand their respective roles in the issues of compliance and blood banking safety. This understanding focuses on efforts to decrease infection risk and physical and chemical hazards in the workplace. The responsibility by law for employee safety ultimately resides with the employer or director of the laboratory. The employer has an obligation to provide a safe work environment by following the imposed standards of care. However, the individual employee must also assume responsibility for his or her health and safety and the safety of co-workers by following laboratory safety policies and procedures. When everyone practices and endorses safety, fewer errors and accidents occur. Thus, the objectives of this lesson is to identify regulating and accrediting agencies for quality and safety, determine safety regulations in current good manufacturing practices, distinguish components of quality control versus quality assurance, establish importance of standard operating procedures, define and apply universal and standard precautions, list safety equipment and protective devices, recognize the need for accident reporting and lab safety program, dispose of laboratory material and lab components properly. Let us start first with our various terminologies. First is the Food and Drug Administration. U.S. agency responsible for the regulation of blood bank industry and other manufacturers of products consumed by humans. So the Food and Drug Administration, or the FDA, classifies blood as a drug. This classification requires all blood banks and transfusion services to follow its legally required standards. The FDA describes standards for quality and safety for transfusion services and blood banks through quality assurance or QA programs and current good manufacturing practices or the CGMPs. Quality efforts and activities enhance efficiency and customer relations, satisfy regulatory requirements, and ultimately provide a safe blood product for transfusion. Let's proceed to our blood bank. Blood bank is defined as uh, the function of the blood bank rather is that it collects, processes, stores, and transports human blood intended for transfusion. While a transfusion service, the function is to perform testing and issues blood and blood components for transfusion. And as what we have said earlier, because blood is classified as a drug, Blood banks and transfusion services must comply with the FDA's regulations. Now let us proceed to the various regulatory and accrediting agencies for quality and safety. So the blood industry is monitored by many regulatory and accrediting agencies. Compliance with industry, federal, state, and local requirements is reviewed by these agencies. Although the rules are presented in the different formats. Uh, they focus on ensuring product quality and blood donor and patient safety. Regulatory and accrediting agencies address similar issues regarding QA and quality improvement. The agencies differ in the degree of authority they have to enforce the standards. Compliance with the standards set by the government agencies such as the FDA Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services or the CMS and state agencies is enforceable by law. Let us again tackle FDA or Food and Drug Administration. So the function is to enforce regulations to ensure the safety and efficacy of biologics, drugs, and devices including blood and blood components and diagnostic reagents used or manufactured by blood components for or manufactured by blood establishments. So the FDA uh, falls under the jurisdiction of the Department of Health and Human Services. Many industries fall within the jurisdiction of the FDA. 
including drugs, cosmetics, uh, food and blood. And then the agency is involved in three areas. So first is the surveillance of facilities or what we call inspections. Next is policy enforcement and then establishment and issue of regulations. The FDA inspects blood establishments and transfusion services to ensure the enforcement. Therefore, each inspection is designed to follow a unit of blood or a blood product from blood donor to patient. The inspection includes many elements of quality and safety, such as errors, accidents, and fatalities, equipment personnel, and disposal of infectious waste. So the FDA publishes its legal requirements in a book which is called the Code of Federal Regulations. So in which it is defined as a publication from the FDA outlining the legal requirements of blood banking facilities. Next agency, we have the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or the CMS, it is a federal agency with uh, a lot of administrative responsibilities such as Medicare, Medicaid, Health Insurance, Portability and Accountability Act, or the HIPAA, and as well as the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendments. So the CMS is responsible for regulating all the laboratory testing except research performed on humans in, uh, in the United States. Let's tackle about CLIA or the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendments. So CLIA has regulations for accurate and reliable laboratory tests in the Code of Federal Regulations. CLIA conducts routine inspections and they may impose sanctions to laboratories not meeting the requirements. They are also responsible for scanning the QR code for more information on the uh, CLIA program. So they have that QR code and then CLIA applies to physicians, office uh, laboratories and then hospital laboratories, areas within the hospital such as the operating room and emergency room and it also includes independent testing laboratories. Now let us move on to the next agency. So we have the AABB, formerly known as the American Association of Blood Banks. It is a voluntary accrediting agency and its publication serve as a guideline uh, for members seeking accreditation. These include the standards for blood banks and transfusion services, the technical manual, and others. So blood banks and transfusion services voluntarily comply with the AABB inspection and accreditation. So accreditation, if your laboratory is accredited, uh, by the AABB, so it is a high recognition of standards. Next is the ISBT or the International Society of Blood Transfusion. So ISBT is not a regulatory or accrediting agency. So the main function of our ISBT is that it supports uh, working parties focusing on specific topics. One working party, red cell immunogenetics and blood group terminology is dedicated to the classification of our human blood group systems under a common nomenclature. So the ISPT is responsible for providing a global standard for worldwide terminology, identification and labeling of medical products of human origin. So it can be of blood or it can be of cell, tissue, and organ products, etc. The next organization we have is our OSHA, or the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, in which it is responsible for ensuring safe and healthy working environment. That's why we have this Occupational Safety and Health Act, in which it is an act enforced by our Occupational Safety and Health Administration in which the goal was to assure safe and healthful working conditions for working men and women 
by authorizing enforcement of the standards developed under the Act. So, uh, Occupational Safety and Health Act is also responsible for assisting and encouraging the states in their efforts to assure safe and healthful, healthful working conditions by providing for research, information, education, and training in the field of occupational safety and health and for other purposes. The next agency we have is our EPA or the Environmental Protection Agency. So, the EPA or the EPA examines the present or the potential threat of medical waste to human health and the environment. So, most medical waste regulations emanate from the individual states or local authorities and are variable because uh, no national policy exists for the handling of medical wastes. Next, we have quality assurance. So the definition is that it comprises the combined activities performed by the organization to ensure the quality of products and services they offer, which must include good manufacturing practices or current good manufacturing practices. Therefore, uh, CGMPs is under our QA. So quality assurance is part of the organization's goal in order to maintain an atmosphere of continuous quality improvement. So quality is the responsibility of everyone in an organization or inside the blood bank laboratory. So therefore, internal quality audits evaluate the effectiveness of the quality system inside the laboratory or from another organization. So therefore, audits are systematic investigations in order to confirm the level of compliance of an organization with the established standard operating procedures. While good manufacturing practices, on the other hand, is defined or its main function is to perform it is performed in blood banks and transfusion services as part of the QA and are legal requirements established by the Food and Drug Administration. So these regulations itemize uh, what needs to be done without necessarily specifying how. In other words, uh, each organization must determine the best way to implement all those good manufacturing practices. So, for example, so they must have their uh, own standard operating procedures, so they must follow their SOPs, so record and document all work performed, qualify personnel by training and education, design and build proper facilities and equipment, clean by following a housekeeping schedule, validate equipment, personnel and processes, etc., Now we will proceed with the components of equality assurance. So first is the records in document. So according to the AABB standards for blood banks and transfusion services, the facility shall have policies, processes, and uh, procedures to ensure document identification, review, approval, and retention. Records are created and stored in accordance with the record retention policies. Examples of records which includes uh, manual logs, worksheets, computer printouts, temperature charts, uh, CD-ROMs, DVDs, and photographs. Now let us proceed uh, between the difference of document control and uh, record keeping. So document control, uh, document control uh, should specify and describe acceptable media to be used, types of documents to be kept, and record retention intervals. So there should be alternative methods uh, placed to handle situations when the automated systems become unavailable. So finally, all record systems, including control, handling, and disposal, must be described thoroughly in the facility standard operating procedures. So now let us define standard operating procedures before we'll proceed with record keeping. So SOPs are written procedures to ensure the complete understanding of a process and to achieve consistency in performance from one individual to another. 
So therefore, every laboratory or every organization should have a standard operating procedure in order for them to be uniformed in everything that they do. Next is record keeping. So good documentation practices, uh, whether manual or computerized, allow tracing of all products collected or transfused by an organization. A thorough record keeping system uh, recreates every step related to the production and distribution of a unit of blood and all its components. So this concept is known as an audit trail and it's very important when investigating errors and accidents. So you must always remember that if it was not recorded, it never happened. So the concept seems simple. However, poor record keeping is the most common violation identified by regulatory and accrediting agencies. So this table uh, shows uh, various examples of good record keeping and bad record keeping. Here's an example of, uh, of an acceptable uh, error correction. So the picture below. So a record is corrected by placing a single line through the error, recording the correct information to the next error, and placing the initials of the person, making the correction along with the date. So a statement describing the reason for the correction is also recommended. So the picture above is not acceptable because it is so messy. So SOP, so we have described it uh, earlier in the previous slide. So it describes how a particular task is to be accomplished. So established methods for performing and administering processes ensure the consistent quality of the final product or result. Internal and external auditors carefully assess on compliance with written SOPs, one of the most serious violations that can be identified during an inspection. So why is uh, SOP very important. So SOPs are important training tools for new employees because these documents should be written using a standard format and the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute uh, publishes guidelines for the development of SOPs. So they need to be written following recommendations of reagent and equipment manufacturers and in compliance with other current good manufacturing practices and industry standards as appropriate. So effective procedures do not need to be worthy. If the documents are user-friendly, they are more likely to be used by the staff. So well-written procedures include all the steps that ensure process control and contribute to the safety, purity, and potency of the blood product. Now let us differentiate standard and universal precautions. The concept of standard precautions was first uh, introduced way back 1987 by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention or the CDC in order to decrease the occup occupational risks of blood-borne diseases such as acquired immune deficiency syndrome and hepatitis B virus to healthcare workers. In 1991, Occupational Safety and Health Administration issued its final standard on occupational exposure to blackboard pathogens, which mandated the use of universal precautions. So our current universal precautions focuses on treating all body substances as potentially harmful and applying appropriate safety measures to decrease possible exposure and infection. The use of protective measures is now based on the healthcare worker's contact with body fluids rather than on patient's diagnosis. So the standard precautions apply when there is a risk of exposure to blood, all body fluids, secretions, excretions except our sweat, non-intact skin including rashes or mucous membranes. Now let us define them one by one. So standard precautions, it is a CDC term defining policies of treating all body substances as potentially infectious and applying safety measures to reduce possible exposure. 
So standard precautions incorporate universal precautions and body substance isolation together. So the standard precautions are the minimum infection prevention practices that apply to all patient care regardless of suspected or confirmed infection status of the patient. In any setting where health care is delivered, these practices are designed to protect the uh, both healthcare provider and prevent the healthcare provider from spreading infections among patients. So standard precautions uh, include hand hygiene, use of personal protective equipment, um, sharp safety, respiratory hygiene or cough etiquette, safe injection practices, sterile instruments and devices, etc. While universal precautions, on the other hand, it is an OSHA term defining policies of treating all bodily uh, substances as potentially infectious and applying safety measures to reduce possible exposure. So universal precautions involve precautions taken with all patients regardless of suspicion of infection to prevent the spread of bloodborne pathogens. So in an Inevitable evolution, standard precautions, in contrast, are steps taken to encompass fighting the spread of airborne pathogens in situations where providers come in contact with any form of body fluid. Now let us have the list of various personal protective equipment and protective devices. So as you can see in the picture, so... These are the uh, differences between the standard PPE, full PPE, and enhanced PPE. But these are the various things that you should remember upon entering the laboratory. So all outerwear worn during the performance of blood banking tasks should be considered contaminated. A fluid-resistant laboratory coat, gown, or apron, whether disposable or made of cotton material, is recommended. Blood bank personnel should wear gloves as a protective barrier when handling any blood or blood products, safety glasses, face shields or masks, splash barriers, and goggles are devices categorized as a protective, uh, personal protective equipment. Safety glasses or goggles should be worn when splashes are likely to occur during a task. Masks are better because they protect the mouth, the nose, and the eyes. Face shields are made of uh, shutterproof plastic and wrap around the face so offering greater protection permanently mounted splash bars over the bench area are preferred when task performance risk is splashing or aerosol contamination the shield should be cleansed and uh, decontaminated on a regular basis to avoid uh, spreading of infection if contaminated So next, we have eye wash stations and showers. So if a splash does occur, so the blood bank should have the availability of a shower and an eye wash device. So an eye wash device should be capable of providing a gentle stream of or spray of aerated water for an extended period. Safety showers treat immediate uh, first aid needs of personnel contaminated with hazardous materials and for extinguishing clothing fires. Procedures and indications for use must be posted, and routine maintenance checks must be performed. Next, we also have our biological safety cabinets or the BSCs, which are containment devices that facilitate safe handling of infectious materials and reduce the risk to personnel and the laboratory environment. Procedures that expose open tubes of blood or units known to be positive for hepatitis B surface antigen or human immune deficiency virus or the HIV are examples of blood bank procedures in which a biosafety cabinet may be useful. Now let's proceed to biohazardous wastes. So all laboratory personnel should be trained in a waste management program that protects the staff members and meets federal, state, and local regulatory requirements. So untrained personnel should not come in contact with or be responsible for biohazardous ma waste materials. Correct identification of material is important to segregate potentially infectious waste from mainstream waste and to control 
cost and volume of infectious waste. Proper handling ensures that medical waste marked as biohazardous materials is placed in designated containers. Containers should be leak-proof and incineration decontamination by autoclaving are currently recommended for the disposal of blood samples and blood products. That's why the process of uh, disposing uh, blood products and other materials or infectious materials is via decontamination. So all laboratory surfaces and reusable, reusable equipment should routinely be cleaned and decontaminated daily and as needed uh, while performing tasks and as spills occur. So there are uh, various lists of uh, environmental protective agency approved disinfectant solutions uh, which can be used to help for decontamination and OSHA also allows the use of EPA registered disinfectants effective against HIV and hepatitis B virus so you can use a diluted bleach solution or a combination of disinfectants for decontamination of your working area so a fresh solution of a 1 is to 10 dilution of sodium hypochlorite or bleach can be used for general disinfection or for spills. Now, let us proceed to personal injury and reporting. So in the event an employee or other person is injured or possible injury or infection exists, an accident report should be initiated. So an accident report should be initiated in all accidents and injuries involving employees or other persons, routine investigation of a minor incident and follow up to correct the risk may thwart a major accident later. So personnel should be encouraged to report all incidents no matter how insignificant they may seem because accident reporting is an essential part of maintaining a safe working environment. Each incident should be treated with a thorough investigation in a non-threatening manner to the employee. And that ends our first lesson for the blood bank laboratory which is entitled Safety in the Blood Bank. I hope that you have learned something from our first lesson and see you and God bless everyone.